So now without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Lauren Goodman, Senior right. Vice President with Ipsos Online Communities. Lauren, you have the floor. Awesome, thank you. And again, thank you everyone for being here. Um, for this research, we're gonna delve into what consumer perception is of sustainability and how they're implementing sustainability in their everyday lives. Um, also what their perception is of corporate responsibility and any barriers they have to actually adopting more sustainable practices. Um, overall, this research is super important, you know, as we shape our sustainability practices at organizations, because we definitely want consumers to adopt it, but they have an evolving expectation of us. So we need to know how to meet them where they are. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Tyler Fields and Lauren Golombeski to review our insights. Thanks, Lauren. Um, hey, everybody. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited about this topic. Um, I know that sustainability is obviously a big topic for everybody at every level. Um, but what I'm really excited about for our presentation today and to chat through in more detail is this idea of everyday sustainability, right? So these small actions that anybody can be taking, whether you're the consumer or uh, at the brand level, um, to enact big changes, this ripple effect. So today we're gonna chat through um, a couple topics um, defining sustainability, um, what it means to be everyday sustainable, what are the habits that are currently being taken, and how companies can help to support that everyday sustainability. Um, before we dive into that, though, I just want to give a really quick overview of how we got here. Um, so for this research, we leveraged um, a community, an online community, um, and I'll dive into that in just a moment um, and give you a sense of um, why it's a really unique tool that Ipsos has and how it can be leveraged for a number of purposes and specifically for this one. So our syndicated community is called Fresh Lab. Um, this is um, what we call a, a panel essentially of online members. It's about four to 6,000 members depending on where we are at replenishment. Um, it's nationally representative and this is what we leverage for our research today. Um, because this is always on tap, it's a really quick tool um, that anybody can leverage for a number of purposes. Um, very in depth, you'll see in a moment that we leverage uh, several different toolkits and methodologies. Um, so really, really in depth in the way that we can and, um, do our research and really, really flexible. Um, and it's also affordable, right? Because these people are always on tap. Um, we're not recruiting them from a vendor for every individual um, survey or, or a qual event, um, a really affordable option as well. So just wanted to highlight this capability that we have um, and why it's pretty exciting. For today specifically though, what we um, dived into was um, this Fresh Lab community and got around just under a thousand members to participate um, in our study. Um, this started earlier this year. You'll see that there's two dates here actually because um, once we had run the first uh, level, which was a quantitative um, segmentation, um, we actually decided that it would be pertinent to also run some qual, some deep dives. And so that's what you see we did um, earlier this month. Uh, what we leveraged was what we call a live chat, which is essentially an online typing tool um, for focus groups. So it's a really small group of members that we can bring back together. Um, each of them had already taken the survey, which is a really unique uh, way that we can retap people from the community um, and ask them questions on topics that they'd already discussed. So a pretty cool tool and something, a real life example of how this is a really great um, tool for, for us to use. We also developed a segmentation that was pr proprietary to Ipso. So this was done by a different service line at a different time, but it's really unique that we were able to take that typing tool um, and plug it into our study. So this is a sustainability segmentation that I'll dive into a little bit more in just a moment, um, but we have developed five segments for sustainability activism, um, all the way down to disengaged denialists, which we'll talk quite a lot about today, all the way up through activists, which we'll also talk about quite a lot. These are the two polarizing segments that we really wanted to deep dive into um, to understand what people are already doing and some of the easy things that can be adopted even down to the lowest level to continue sustainability efforts on an everyday scale. Really quickly, just to give you some more of the overview and then we'll dive into some of our more exciting findings, just wanna give you a sense of what the segmentation looks like. Um, these names are pretty telling, right? But just a, a quick glimpse at each of them. Uh, the activists are much more likely to be um, activists in the uh, sustainability um, landscape. Um, they tend to be a little bit younger and female. Um, and as we'll chat through, um, they're really doing the most um, on an everyday scale to be sustainable. Pragmatists a little bit less. Um, they tend to be a little bit more affluent, um, but they will consider cost uh, when it comes to sustainability. So it has to be accessible to them in some way, right? 
Um, continuing on down the scale here, um, while conflicted contributors are concerned about the environment, um, the finances, and the convenience is really going to take precedence. If they can't find that, um, they're not going to go toward um, the activism, toward sustainability, and that's really important. And then these last two um, are at the most disengaged into the stale, the busy bystanders and the disengaged denialists. Um, this is all the way down to people who actually might think that um, sustainability is trendy or even fake, which we'll dive into in a little bit. Um, so you can really see the full swath of, of those who participate or don't participate in everyday sustainability efforts. To that end, let's go ahead and take a look at the current landscape, right? So how do people currently define sustainability? We'll start here by taking a quick snapshot of um, how important sustainability is over time. So this is a question that we've asked in various different surveys, including ours that we ran earlier this year um, for a light tracking, right? So uh, we asked this before COVID, we asked it late last year and again earlier uh, this year in our study. And you can see that sustainability, while not the very top um, in terms of importance, has not declined at all over these last years, even despite things like COVID, even despite things like um, potential inflation, uh, things like that. So uh, it is important and it is still on top of everybody's mind to varying degrees, obviously, but on a total level, um, it still is as important as, as it always has been. So let's take a look at what uh, sustainability is and what it isn't. What you're looking at here is a topic wheel. Um, it's a way for us to take unstructured data like open and qual and make it a little bit more structured so that we can see visually what, what's really popping to the top. This is on total, and I will dive in uh, in a moment to the polarizing segments to get a sense of um, the real push and pull on how people think about sustainability. But at the total level, you can see that there's some obvious things here, like recyclable, right? Like that's a tangible thing that we all know that sustainability is. Um, Eco-friendly, um, it's worth the investment, things like that. But what I found really interesting about this is that the second largest piece of this pie is a little bit more of a sentiment. It's care for the future. So sustainability is about the future. It's about posterity. And that's going to be really important to consider because it's not going away. And people don't want it to go away. They, they recognize that it's important. We also asked what it isn't. Again, there's some tangible things here, like it's not waste, right? Like it's not pollution. We, we know that, that's a pretty easy answer. Um, but there is a sliver here, and again, this is on total, that mentions that it's not simple. So my big takeaway here is on a total level, people recognize that it's important for our posterity and for our future, but it's not the easy decision always. So how can we make that easier? So again, returning to the narrative, what are the everyday sustainability habits that people are currently taking or want to take uh, to make it a little bit more simple um, and effective for everybody. As I mentioned or alluded to just a moment ago, here I'm actually showing you, again, the definition of sustainability, but what we're looking at are topic wheels for the activists. So if you remember the very uh, left side of that, that segmentation, down to the denialists. So these are the two polarizing segments that we're really gonna do a deep dive into today. You can see that both have a pretty big piece of the pie for care of the future and recyclable. So not super surprising. Um, those were also the biggest pieces of the pie for the total. Um, so that's really gonna stand out. Um, and I think that it's important to note that even those on the end, the denialist end, do think that there is an amount of, of uh, future and, and caring for the future um, sentiment here, which is, I going to be important for this narrative. But if you guys notice, and I'm highlighting it here in the pink, a lot of denialists also think that this is simply fake. It's trendy. So how can we convince them? Uh, how can we, companies and other consumers, convince them um, and everybody that it is an important thing? They recognize that it's an important thing, but uh, we need to convince them how it is and what everyday sustainability efforts look like to make it easy for them. This I won't dwell too long on, but I found interesting. So what you're looking at is a division of the segmentation by generation. You might think that um, it would naturally follow a trend that maybe the older, more conservative tend to be denialist. But what you're looking at is that there's a huge swath of the younger generations who are actually considered busy bystanders and denialists. We have a few POVs on this. This um, did not actually come from our study, but from um, a secondary study also done at Ipsos. So um, there are some POVs in there. I won't dwell too long on it. But what I am noting here is that it's not going away. Like this isn't a trend that's gonna die out with the generations. It's actually quite a lot more important um, to convince these younger folks why it's important and how they can take action. 
some POVs um, really quickly might be that um, Gen Z don't have spending power yet, right? So they're not going to be able to buy longer lasting products um, or those that are higher quality or of sustainable nature. Um, also, it's harder to convince this generation that we're actually taking action. Um, does my recycling actually go to recycling plant or is it just thrown away? So what can we be doing on the brand level and at the consumer level to convince them that it is an important issue um, that they can act on pretty easily? So here I'm showing you um, that despite what segment you're in, there is an increased awareness um, and involvement towards sustainability. So this is top two um, box for um, in the last couple of years, what efforts have you made? So an increased amount of effort um, towards being green and sustainable. So obviously the denialists, um, it's a pretty small sliver, but it's not nothing, right? There is some acknowledgement toward it. Um, and at the opposite end of the spectrum, quite a lot more activists continue to adopt new measures and everyday sustainability practices. And so it's moving in that direction. So how can we push that momentum and keep that moving forward? So now that we've taken a look at um, what everyday sustainability is, I want to take a look at what people are currently doing. And again, to return to the sort of the crux of all of this is there are some people who are doing quite a lot already. And even the denialists who might not be doing as much recognize that there are small things they can be doing. So what can we show them? How can we demonstrate uh, what they can be doing to, to really enact that uh, for greater change down the road? So what you're looking at here are the two polarizing segments. The blue will be the activists and the yellow will be the denialists. This is um, a closed-ended question um, that we ask them on simple uh, practices that they're currently doing. So you'll see things like recycling, using low energy light bulbs, hand drying, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the activists are doing quite a lot more. In fact, there's nothing they're not doing. There's 0% on the none of the above, right? So they're all doing something, but quite a lot of the denialists still aren't doing much. What we uncovered though, and I want to return to why I think that our toolkit and the community is so interesting and unique um, and flexible, is because when we asked this question in the survey, great, like you can see here, there's some, there's some insight, but we didn't really get a ton of the in-depth. And so what we decided to do was actually go back to these members, and we have uh, hosted two live chats, one with the activists and one with the denialists. Again, these are they're similar to, to focus groups, right? And so we wanted to get an understanding organically from them um, what they were currently doing um, and, and the things that they think other people could be doing as well. And to chat through that deep dive, I'm actually going to hand it over to my colleague, Lauren Golombeski, who, who ran that research. Thanks, Tyler. So we asked participants to tell us organically instead of a close ended list of what sort of everyday sustainable or green habits they have. And we find that there's actually a a ton of overlap between the two groups. Biggest commonality, unsurprisingly, being recycling, but we're also seeing that denialists are doing things like composting or buying cars with better gas mileage, though they do say that maybe a hybrid car would be a step too far as it kind of denotes maybe a fad or a bit too trendy or showy. It might just be a step too far. But denialists are also doing things like buying local or using less water, less plastic, even less electricity. But where we see these two groups part, I think, is that activists are really willing to go the extra mile. They're just always thinking how they can be more sustainable. So in many ways, there's no area of their life that's untouched by this sustainable thinking and reasoning. So we see they're willing to do inconvenient things like collecting rainwater or using rechargeable batteries, whereas denialists really know their limit and they're only going to do things that are convenient, easy, without much sacrifice. So when thinking about the sentiment of these two polar groups, I think it's important to kind of take um, just establish that foundation quickly. So for activists, the little things matter. They are always looking for new ways to take action because it's the right thing to do. It's good for the planet. It's good for future generations, good for their loved ones, for their family. Plus, it just makes them feel good. And it's something that is important to them. It makes them feel like they're doing their part. They're making these very thoughtful micro actions and decisions every single day. So if they're changing out their dog's water, they're gonna think, how can I repurpose this? How can I utilize it? Just like they would do with any other micro action. So instead of throwing the water down the drain, they might use it to um, water plants instead. And then denialists is very different. They might be taking similar actions, but it's on a much smaller scale. And it's basic things like recycling as, we've, as we saw and we'll talk more about. But again, it's not showy. It's usually tied to convenience. 
It's just when things are easy or when it provides economic savings. For example, one denialist mentioned that their recycling is only picked up once a month. So whenever they have overflow in their recycling bin, they will throw it out because if it's not convenient, they're not going to recycle. So another denialist mentioned, I do things because they make sense. So it has to make sense to them. It has to provide value. So if we were to reduce these two sentiments, I think it would look something like activists are motivated by altruism, whereas denialists are motivated by practicality. And I love this succinct quote by this denialist that says, we are judicious, just not rabid. So when we ask these two groups what really limits them or prevents them from doing more, their answers are very similar, but just to varying degrees. So convenience, that's a roadblock, as we know, for denialists, it's a big one, but it actually can also be a pain point for activists who feel maybe inconvenienced by their city not helping them more, maybe by providing more regular recycling pickups or recycling bins around the city. Now, yeah, that's not going to prevent them from recycling as it would for denialists, but it still creates a problem that they then have to solve. Cost, another huge one for denialists. But um, price actually also limits um, activists as well. So when they want things like solar panels or to buy hybrid cars for everyone and their family, they may be thwarted by those sustainable desires because they can't afford it. So price does become a frustrating point for them. And then quality is another area that provides a different kind of roadblock for activists and denialists because denialists actually have this mindset that sustainable products or green products are lower in quality and they would never want to cut corners in the name of sustainability. They prioritize quality like cost, like convenience, so that is not a trade-off they're willing to make. Whereas activists don't have that preconceived notion. They find environmentally friendly or green products as good quality and many of their favorite products are actually green or sustainable. And I like that um, one of our participants actually joked about this topic by saying that they had never had a reusable bag break on them at the grocery store, but they've definitely had that happen with plastic or paper bags. So it's kind of a joke to them. But at the same time, of course, they recognize that not all products meet that mark of high quality, like deodorant or some soaps, as things that they mentioned. And that can definitely become a deterrent. But they're still going to opt for a sustainable product. It's just something that they will have to shop around for or provides more, maybe requires more trial and error. I think in the same vein, efficacy and longevity of products are also important. But what's important and what's interesting, actually, is that activists really see sustainable products as good for them. It's good for the environment. It's good for their family. It's safer, even in some cases, healthier. So even if a product is slightly less effective, they're still going to be more willing to grab those things. But of course, they do not want to have to sacrifice anything. And then time we see is a a big roadblock for everyone, as I'm sure you can relate. No one has enough time. So things like composting, gardening, making sure those batteries are recharged, that takes time and is something that no one has in excess. So another thing that's interesting is that many recognize that some of these problems that these roadblocks create can actually be solved by other entities. So with that in mind, we really wanted to ask consumers like who that greatest onus then is actually on. Yeah, and you'll see here, thanks so much, Lauren, you'll see here that half of these people do think it's on them, right? They're willing to do things like drink out of the paper straws and things, but more than half think that the onus is on companies. So to to Lauren's point a moment ago, there are roadblocks that are big and small. Some of the small ones they can take on themselves, but some of the bigger ones are going to have to go to someone else, right? With more manpower, with more resources, with more money. So what we want to take a look at here is this fine balance between uh, who holds the responsibility. And in truth, it is the, the tug of war, the push and pull between consumer and brand. Well, some obvious reasons for that are because brands simply have the control of production. You can't buy a sustainable product if they don't exist. Um, consumers, um, they make the choices, uh, and then brands have the money and resources, as we just mentioned. There are some bigger problems that require some bigger manpower and resources, and it simply is not going to come from the consumers. But what they do is drive that demand, which is really important, right? So we know this is a pretty classic model, but um, it really ladders well into to our conversation today on um, who owns the responsibility. And this push and pull is exactly what um, is going to create that. 
someone to make it and those to consume it. And here I just want to dwell quickly on um, highlighting that. So everybody up from activists down to denialists do think that a lot of um, the responsibility does fall to, to companies. This denialist here says they have the resources, time, money, manpower. There are some roadblocks that are simply not, um, the, the, that they're not able to overcome on their own. Um, and so it's gonna go to the companies. And so with that in mind, uh, we did take a pretty big deep dive into what that means. So what does it look like for companies to message this, to do better, to own the responsibility and how do consumers expect them to do that um, and to be better in their in their name, right? So that they can also adopt these everyday sustainability practices for themselves. And again, I'd like to hand it over to Lauren who helped to, to run that deep dive. Yeah, so while we know that it's company's responsibility, we just asked for them to come up with an organic list, wasn't close-ended, open-ended, of what everyday small actions that they would like to see companies do. And some of them are obvious, and things like less packaging, recycling, reducing uh, plastic, using more recyclable materials. Um, a lot of these you'll actually recognize as actions that consumers are already doing for themselves, but they want to know what you're doing. And there's also a conversation around what pollution, what are you doing for the pollution or um, excess that is caused by your manufacturing processes? Are you reusing or recycling your raw materials? Are they sustainable? Consumers just would love to see how you partner with them because they know that they're doing their part as best they can, so they want help allowing them to make it easier. So things like offering them to have their packages or products shipped in fewer boxes or providing more informa information directly on the package, like how to recycle, how they can donate. And by how to recycle, I mean how to recycle this specific package or product that you're providing. Um, what is your company culture like? Are you educating your employees on sustainable practices? Are you rewarding employees for that? Another big thing that came up here is the sentiment that products are no longer um, made the way that they used to. They don't last as long. So consumers would like to see you partner with them on how they can amend that to make longer lasting products so then they can naturally waste less and feel better about it. Consumers also recognize that some of these things may be a little hard to do or inconvenient or require a five, 10 year plan, but I think they're just happy to see you start anywhere on that journey. So as one member mentioned, maybe instead of having this huge um, designation or committee to reduce plastic and conserve water, maybe you just start with giving employees company water bottles to keep and use every day because that would be beneficial for all parties. So with that in mind, um, we asked them how you can communicate these things or do these things in a genuine way. And it really all comes down to transparency. It's this overwhelming sentiment of don't tell us, but show us. So consumers wanna see actual statistics. They wanna see charts, they wanna see data. They wanna see how you're currently making changes and how you've changed from five years ago, or where will you be in five years? They really wanna see that growth and they wanna see it to believe it, or else they won't believe it. They are not at the point where they're gonna just take your word for it. They also wanna see what you're gaining or losing. There is this thought, and actually I'll just read this quote because I really like it. Um, uh, you can be green all day, but if numbers don't fit, green ain't it. There's this feeling that companies will not prioritize sustainable actions if it means that they're losing money. So show them how you're gaining financially. They already assume that it's happening or on the other side, debunk that and show them how you're losing it or where you're taking the hit. But in the end, I think it's just most important and, and participants tell us this very, um, very seriously that they want to be communicated these things in a sincere and it's in a sincere and informative way. So again, I think it comes back down to this partnership that we are in this together and you are here to help make things easier and to solve some of these problems. So on the other hand, what you shouldn't do is pretty much the opposite of what I just shared. So providing zero proof of actions that just sustains that negative talk that's already out there. Plus there's a lot of distrust, so you don't wanna feel that. I think consumers also don't wanna feel guilty, and this is a huge one for denialists particularly. They already feel that they're doing all they can or that they want, so they don't want to feel any guilt. 
But activists also mention a lot of guilt that they already put on themselves. One person mentioned feeling guilty throwing out a piece of paper or driving anywhere close that they could actually walk to. So you don't want to add to the guilt because that's certainly already covered. Plus, I think that consumers have very sensitive hypocrisy alarms. They don't want companies and brands making them feel guilty, especially when they feel like these entities have the greater responsibility. So they don't want big salesy campaigns as it feels inauthentic. Um, they also know that if you're prioritizing money over sustainability, they don't want this big show of, well, look at what we're doing. This is so great. So there has to be authenticity attached to everything. I think there's this gentle balance of transparency and not being salesy. And this is really exemplified with um, celebrity endorsements as consumers don't really like it. It feels inauthentic. They know celebrities have money, they have resources. So in most cases, they don't want celebs to tell them what to do with their money, especially when they are like most likely making money off of the endorsement itself. So it can actually feel a little bit hypocritical. I think the only maybe um, exemption to this is if there's a celebrity that is very, um, is well known for doing sustainable supporting sustainable causes, maybe they would be more open to that. But specifically, they just communicated that they're not into the celebrity campaigns when it's related to sustainability. And lastly, um, they don't want the cost to be all on them. It should be shared. Many just are willing to pay more, actually, for sustainable products that last longer, that can be reused, especially if it's a high quality product. So they don't feel that they're being unreasonable but they want to see that partnership. They want to see the burden and the efforts are shared. And I think they want to see this in all areas of sustainability. So now I'll pass it back to Tyler to kind of discuss what this all means and answer some questions. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so to drive this home, just uh, to reiterate what we've been chatting through today, um, you know, pretty simple narrative, right? Like everyday sustainability is important. A lot of people are already doing it, but um, some of them do feel conflicted on either how to do more of it um, or where the responsibility really lies. And that's what we want to drive home today is many are already doing something and there's got to be another level to that. And that's where brands come in. That's where you come in. So what are you doing to help them and be a partner with them all the way down to those who might find it a little gimmicky? How can you alleviate that feeling of gimmicky or that it's trendy? Are you proving to them the actions you're taking or the actions they can take with your products are real? Can they be recycled for real? Are you actually making steps in your own company culture and, and on the manufacturing line to make sure that um, you're meeting them halfway, um, making it easy for them and things like that? So highlight your sustainability actions and products, right? So um, do people even know that they are? Do people even know that you've made an effort recently? Um, highlight that. Show them where it already exists and where it might exist in the future. Um, that simple means of communication and honesty is going to be huge um, because especially as I mentioned earlier for those who just simply don't know like possibly Gen Z or don't believe you this is an easy way to alleviate that. Lean into authenticity so again um, showing them real numbers it's not so much to say that we are vaguely going to do something by 2050, um, show them what you've already been doing or even some of the small things. Have you eliminated plastic and, and um, used glass? That could be something small that maybe doesn't feel worth communicating, but at the end of the day really truly is. And I think to that end is especially important because what we're talking about here today is everyday sustainability practices. And that on you know a very small level, even though it feels small, is every day. It's showing that you are also doing the things that you expect your consumers to do which is to make these these strides alongside you and then close the loop i think this is kind of an easy one um, but also is is really important um, have you already done something have you already exchanged plastic for glass say that communicate that somehow in an authentic way right um, it might feel small and obviously not worth like an ad or a promotion or something but um, just putting that information in the world um, whether it's through philanthropic endeavors um, some real changes that you've made as i mentioned i keep using the example of exchanging plastic for glass um, it, you know it doesn't deserve an ad necessarily but it does deserve to be um, communicated on some level show the things you've done whether it's because you've heard feedback from the consumer which is what we're providing you today um, or any other measures that um, you've made. It's going to be it's going to be really really important. And to that end, um, we can actually move into some questions. Laura, I think you are able to see. Yeah, okay. yeah I can see some. 
Um, okay, first, so do the denialists think that everyday sustainability, or excuse me, do the denialists think that everyday sustainable habits make any difference? Um, I can answer this, actually. Yep, yep. So, you know, it's interesting because they they do. They do think that everyday sustainability habits make, any, make a difference. Um, they mention that actually these, when they take these actions, that actually makes them feel better. Um, they also have a ton of skepticism. So they'll say things like um, their recyclables are probably ending up in a landfill, but they will maybe attach to that. Well, at least I'm trying though. I can also recall another denialist mentioning on a larger scale that when the plastic that used to attach um, Coke cans together, when that was banned because it was killing marine life, that they actually commented like that, well, that certainly made a difference. So I think that um, for the most part, they feel like these things make a difference, especially on a micro and a macro level, but they just don't want to be forced or guilted into it. Yeah. And it sounds like to that end, it also might just be proving to them that, you know, like if they don't believe that it's happening, then maybe they're going to stop doing it. Um, and again, that sort of ladders into that idea that, you know, is it fake? Is it trendy? You guys are using these buzz buzzwords, but to what end? So those small actions like closing the loop, like, look, it actually did mean a lot that you cut the, the plastic from the Coke cans or um, that you're recycling. We can prove to you that it is being recycled. Um, you know, like demonstrating on your packaging that some of it was used by recycled materials and things like that um, can be really beneficial, especially for those that are a little bit more resistant to that change, the, the denialists, right? Because activists are already doing quite a lot. So I think that you make a really good point, Lauren. As long as they believe it, they're gonna they're gonna make that change, or they're going to at least put some effort into it. It's got to be a little bit convenient, um, and you've got to prove that it's actually helping. Um, but they're 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 willing to take that step. Great. Cool. Yeah, I agree. Uh, next question. I like the text charts of defining sustainability. Can you speak a bit more on how you produce those? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll take that one. Um, let me actually. Sorry, everybody. I'm gonna back up a bit. So what this person is mentioning is our topic wheel. So this is, um, I mentioned we took this from our open ends. I, I use the term taking unstructured data and making it structured. So um, yeah, we um, have developed um, a, a, a library, a, a, a verbs library um, that we run all of our open ends through. Um, there are some ways that we can do this better and worse. The way that we use this one was actually a really good practice, which is where we just had members list words or very short phrases. Um, and we had them do it thrice, I think, uh, for both defining and what it isn't. Um, and we ran that through a text library and we're able to basically automate um, these buckets. So there's the categories and then there's a little bit more drilled down specifics on um, what, they're, what they're mentioning. So each of their terms, regardless of what it was, ladders into a more um, a broader, larger topic um, or category. Um, that's what you're seeing here in essence. So um, there's a couple pitfalls to this. For instance, it doesn't add up to 100. Um, it's not mutually exclusive. So it really is meant to give you a sense of like the proportion without it being an exact pie chart. So um, throw that notion out the window, but um, it does help you really quickly visualize um, and it helps to automate the system a lot. So when we're doing our studies, especially when they're open ends, and we can do this in real time, whether it's through focus groups, live chats, um, discussion boards, um, things like that, we can develop sentiment and begin categorizing really, really quickly. So this is a great chart. Um, so instead of just giving you guys like a list of words or a word cloud, uh, we can help bring you some more of that structure a little bit better. Um, it's really, really quick. Um, it's something we've been excited about in the last few years um, and super affordable as well because um, it's largely automated. And we know the, the big buzz around AI, this is only gonna get better, um, but this is something that we've made a best practice and a standard in all of our community work um, in the last few years. So hopefully that answers your question. So now we have a few more questions. Some of them are quite involved, so thank you for that. Um, love to see the interest there. I think it makes sense, Tyler, if you agree. I would love to um, maybe give the group 10 minutes back and follow up via email so that we can really expand. Yeah, absolutely. Things. If they feel a little bit involved, um, we're happy to type them out a little bit more. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. I think um, with everybody's busy schedule, just getting some time back, it was really a pleasure to chat with everybody, um, and we will follow up via email. Um, and thanks everybody. Um, I wonder, uh, Ellen, did you have any closing remarks? Well, I just really want to thank the team here, both Lawrence and Tyler, um, for today's really interesting presentation. 
Be on the lookout for a link to today's recorded presentation. That will come in the next couple of days. And as well, the team here will be responding to those questions that have been um, unanswered. But also, feel free to reach out to us at any time and continue with those great questions um, on such an important topic. That now concludes today's IPSOS webinar.